Sometimes it's the physical parts of this hobby that suck the most. If you've ever thought about running your own servers for home or business use, but don't want to deal with the headaches of maintaining hardware, why not let Linode host your services for you? They make it simple to deploy and manage your own cloud infrastructure, with solutions ranging from a single shared CPU to massive multi-core virtual machines. You can even add in dedicated enterprise GPUs for machine learning. Linode also recently started rolling out high-speed NVMe block storage to all 11 of their global data centers. Best of all, storage rates will remain at the same low price they always have been. With shared CPU plans starting at as little as $5 per month and scaling up to as high as you need to go, you'll be able to find a hosting plan that fits your needs. They also have 24-7, 365 support available, regardless of your plan size. That's a better support plan than I have on my personal server rack, I can tell you that much. Visit linode.com slash craftcomputing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craftcomputing. And thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and I meet you in front of my server rack. Now, fortunately, there's nothing wrong with my server rack per se. It's more of what's happening downstairs. You see, this fiber cable right here is the one that provides data down to my office at 10 gigabit per second. However, there is a problem with this line right now, and that is it's not working. So see this light right here, that little activity light? Uh, that should be flashing, kind of like the rest of these lights are flashing. This one's not, which means it has no link. So today I am probably going to run a brand new fiber line if the line between the two points is indeed the issue. And I know it's not the most exciting premise for a video as I'm just undoing work that I had already previously done and then redoing it. But I'll show you how I ran the fiber line and we'll see if we can find where the problem actually lies. I'll also be doing something properly that I didn't do properly in the first place, and that is running an outdoor rated fiber cable. You see, I was kind of in a hurry and also didn't know the exact distance between the two points that I needed to run, and so I bought an indoor fiber cable because it was fairly inexpensive, and I figured it would last me three, four, five years. Well, it lasted me almost exactly two years to the day. Now, when I say I ran things improperly, I really did mean it. This is my fiber cable that runs all the way down to my office. And as you can see, this is quite the maintenance loop. This is about an extra, I don't know, 20, 25 meters of cable that I wound up not using as I bought a 50 meter fiber cable to run what ended up being about 20 to 22 meters. There are a couple inherent issues with running indoor rated cable outside. Number one, it's not UV shielded, which means the sun will eventually degrade this cable to the point where the shielding will break down and the cable can either be damaged by the sun directly or possibly some other method because it's no longer as structurally sound. And number two is because I ran so much cable and just hung it on this little uh, electrical conduit loop, uh, you can see the weight of this cable actually ended up kinking this right here. That's not exactly a proper bend radius for an OM4 fiber. So right here is where the cable hangs. This is the cable that runs down to power my cable modem. And then this is the exhaust from my in-rack air conditioner. And right down here is where both those cables pop back into the garage. Going the other direction, it flies along my gutter there, dives down, and then wraps around the front of the house and dives into the office right down there. Now, on each side of that cable, I do have patch cables that are connecting the actual ends to the final switches. And I have tested both the patch cables and the keystone jacks they're plugged into, and all of those test out. So the only thing that this could be is either the fiber modules, which I have not tested yet, or the outdoor cable itself. And my money, is on the outdoor cable itself. And you can see on this side of the wall, I have a very nice wall plate with a couple of keystone jacks and some patch cables that actually complete the run into the server. So let's go ahead and start right here with it and see if we can take this cable out and possibly find the problem along the way. Let's get started. And I really wish I would have filmed myself taking that plate off the wall because as Adam Savage would say, there's your problem. Uh, let me get you in for a closer look. As you can hopefully see there, uh, something gave this cable quite a tug and literally ripped the shielding off of it and probably damaged the cable 
right inside there. Remember, the fiber cable is about the same width as a human hair, so what you see on the ends of the cable are actually just the plastic housing for it. Uh, the cable inside of this is actually quite delicate, so that is likely where our break happened. Now, I know this question is going to come up since the break is right at the end. Why don't I just terminate a brand new fiber cable end? Well, I do get asked all the time, number one, how do I terminate Cat5 and Cat6 cables? And also, how do I terminate fiber cables? Let me show you. For Cat5 and Cat6, I have this tool right here for Monoprice. It is the MDL110K6 uh, Professional Network Toolkit. What this is, is a crimper, a punch down tool, a couple of wire strippers, a continuity tester, and it also comes with a couple plugs. This will run you about $100 to $115, depending on where you pick it up from. And honestly, it has been a very solid piece of kit. And how do you terminate fiber cable? by buying new fiber cable with pre-terminated ends. For the hobbyist and even the industry professional, you're not going to terminate your own fiber. Uh, the tool set required is well beyond what you should be spending as a hobbyist or even as someone who does it on a three times a year basis. For a very basic toolkit, you're looking at about $1,500 just to terminate the fiber, and that doesn't come with the validation tools required to make sure that it's actually a good termination. Now, if you're doing custom runs and in-wall stuff, you could always pay someone to come out and terminate fiber for you, but that will easily run you into the multiple hundreds of dollars just for a single plug. Whereas this 20 meter pre-terminated armored outdoor rated fiber cable was only about $65. So if you want to run fiber, just buy one with ends on it. So what makes a fiber cable outdoor rated? Well, it's a number of different things. This is a standard indoor patch cable. This is just a little one meter one that I pulled off my rack. Uh, this is a pair of fiber cables that run through essentially just some plastic sheeting. There's nothing really to protect the cable from any kind of tugs, pulls, environment, uh, any kind of UV damage. This is about as basic as they get, and for an indoor environment, they do a fantastic job. Now, an outdoor fiber cable looks very similar other than the fact that it's black instead of aqua or orange or yellow. Uh, it has the same LC plugs on the end of it, at least that's the plugs that I use, uh, but the differences are, number one, this plastic is UV rated, which means it will not break down in the sun. Number two, inside of this sheathing is also a layer of Kevlar and another layer of wrapped metal to help with any kind of environmental abuse that it might incur. So this is what you should be running if your cable runs outdoors. Not what I ran last time. All right, let's go ahead and get this fiber torn down and get the new stuff ran. Well, that was cold and miserable, but I guess that's what I get for my fiber line dying in early January in Oregon. Anyway, uh, the fiber line is now ran, and in fact, I have it poking through the wall right here. So this has already been terminated on the other side into my uh, little pass-through keystone jack. Uh, I just need to plug it into this one, and then we can see if the link is restored. I hope that made sense, because I am really cold right now. And on a side note, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good because that's literally all of the slack that I have in a 20 meter cable. That's it. All right, wall plate is back on and we are at the moment of truth. Let's go ahead and plug in the switch again and see if we get lights finally. There's one. There's two, hey, we got lights. It's working! So, like I said, sometimes the physical aspect of this hobby really sucks, but it's all of this that kind of makes it worth it. I have so much fun doing this kind of stuff and getting to tinker with 10 and shortly to be 40 gig network here in my home rack. But that's a subject for another video. 
If you're interested in the switches that I use and the cables that I just ran to get 10 gig from one side of my house to the other, I will have Amazon affiliate links down in the video description. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, like buying new fiber cables, head on down to the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself, John, Rhett, Steve, all the hosts from Talking Heads, and keep the conversation going with the awesome community that hangs out over there. That's going to do it for me in this one, guys. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. I'm going to go grab a beer. <laughs>